This is the story of two East End brothers, John and Ronnie Knight. Ronnie Knight ran clubs, but kept a life of crime secret from his movie star wife. His younger brother John masterminded Britain's biggest cash robbery. Ronnie escaped to Spain with stolen money and defied British justice for a decade. Now, for the first time, John Knight tells the inside story of how he stole five tons of cash. We didn't know it was going to be this easy, but it was. It's nice to have money, plenty of money, because you can buy anything. A new car, a lovely house, a villa abroad, an apartment, anything, with money. In 1983, brothers John and Ron Knight were at the height of their success. John Knight ran a garage and made money on the side from the Fox Pub in London's East End. Ronnie Knight's career as a Soho club owner was boosted by the fame of his wife. My name was Ronnie Knight. I was married at the Barbara Windsor, so that, that, that made it more, me more famous. If I wasn't mad at Barbara Windsor, no one would know I'd be just like anybody else. The brothers' wives had become friends. Barbara was very good to me in her own way, and we, we used to have a giggle. We just used to, like mates, have a laugh, and uh, we, just, we just got on well. The couples shared holidays at Villa Liminar, the Spanish retreat Ronnie and John Knight had built together in 1974. But the wives didn't know their husband's hunger for the good life in Spain would lead to a six million pound robbery. The inside story of Britain's biggest cash heist has been a secret between brothers. Until now. The Knight family grew up in Hoxton in London's East End. I was a known family, you know, you know what I mean? Nobody could take a liberty with them. I was well liked. Ronnie got to know the local gang leaders. If he known it, I used to see Ronnie and Reggie at that time. My brother was very, very close to Ronnie and Reggie Cray. In 1958, Ronnie Knight drove the getaway car when the Cray twins beat up rivals. So when Ronnie and them got out, they was cost up with hammers, choppers and everything you could think of, and just smashed the door right in, you know, and just walked in and said, well, who wants trouble now? We're back with the Cray twins, no one wants it. But prior to meeting the Craze, Ronnie had recruited his younger brother as his partner in crime. My first crime that I ever did was when my brother Ron come to me and asked me to get in a small fan light over the top of a door and uh, take the cash drawer till out and pass it out of the fan light. I was too big for that. So I thought the only person who could do that is my Johnny because he's a lot younger than me and a lot smaller than me, see? he come out with a prize. I took to crime because um, I used to see the old villains, um, very smart, looking dressed, and uh, everyone was ducking and diving about. There was loads of rascals. All my friends were doing something wrong. I joined the band of robbers. Although two years younger, John Knight soon surpassed Ronnie in organising crime. By the time I was 20, I was doing a hell of a lot of things. I was uh, looking for lorry loads, taking and driving away lorry loads. I could always ask Ronnie for a helping hand. You just, you knew what kind of lorry was holding good stuff, and you took it. And, uh, and, uh, you, and then you sold it, and it, it was bringing money in all the time, you know. You know, we trusted one another, and I would never leave him, and he would never leave me. Ronnie married June Billingham in 1960, when she became pregnant with his first child. Soon after, another girl caught his eye. 
I was with Ronnie when he met Barbara. She was promoting shoes in a shoe shop. I went to buy something, I come back in the shop and Ronnie was uh, talking to Barbara. Well, she's such a teeny one and she was laughing, she's a joker, wasn't she? So uh, it was just one of them things, you know, she, uh, she had big boobs and whatever you call them. And, and that's how we started, you know, we started talking and next thing you know, uh, we was together. And unfortunately, I still married with, with um, during bed, I was always out every night. A nighttime lorry theft in 1961 earned Ronnie his first stint in jail. On the day of his release, he had to choose between his wife and Barbara Windsor. When I arrived there, he hadn't come out of the prison. It was in the Isle of Sheppey, um, down in Kent. I went down there to pick him up, and I arrived there, and he'd come out the gates. And um, he'd come out, and uh, I said, I'm here to pick you up, and he said, uh, uh, Barbara's here waiting for me. I've got to go and have a chat with her, I won't be a minute. He went over and had a little conversation with Barbara, and he come back to me and he says, uh, I'm going home with Barbara. So I had to go back and face the music with his, with June. It was a bit of a joke for Johnny, really, I suppose, because he must have made all arrangements to bring me home, but she already knew I wasn't coming home to her anyway, so... Not a, not a nice thing to do anyway, but uh, obviously I've done it. In 1964, Barbara Windsor's movie career took off, but Ronnie Knight's life of crime would take a tragic turn. At the height of the swinging 60s, Ronnie Knight became a club owner in London's West End, but he kept his links to an East End life of crime. It wasn't only the... Um um, the artists up there, the stars or whatever, we had uh, the rascals and you know, the criminals come up there. And anything anybody had, they knew that I would buy. There was fur coats out of, um, uh, you know, the big stores and all that. Anything like that was suits, sweaters, shirts, anything. But they used to take, it wasn't one, it was always dozens and dozens of this and dozens of that. So it was a good buy, you know, and I knew I could, I knew enough got it half price anyway. David was the youngest Knight brother. His death would have a profound and continuing effect on Ronnie, creating a thirst for revenge that would change his reputation from celebrity to notoriety. In 1969, David became caught up in his brother's gangland feud. There's a small war, really. But um, we made arrangements to go to the Latin Quarter to meet the boys and, uh, and, and they will shake hands and say like, you know, it's, you know, feel sorry for what's happened. But the peace conference at the cabaret would go wrong, causing Alfredo Zomparelli, the club's bouncer, to intervene. And of course that's all starts off again. It's where you know everyone's jumping up in the air, wants to fight, and uh, unknown to me, this, this Pirelli slips into the kitchen and come out with, the, with a big carving knife. As I come up the stairs, my David was already stabbed in the back. John walked in to see his brother in a deadly face-off. Some prelly wielding a knife about. Ronnie's got a chair holding him back with it. I picked a chair up and he looked at us both and then he decided to have it away. There was a scream, a woman's scream. And David's laying on the floor on the stairs, dying. Blood was pouring out of him and uh, he was just looking up at me like that. I said, come on, Dave, get together, mate. You're all right. But obviously, I didn't know it was that bad. Then next thing you know, I shouted, get the ambulance, and the ambulance was down and just took him away. I sat outside the hospital for a little while, just sitting there, just in case, you know, that I had the courage to go in. A doctor come down in a white coat and said, uh, your brother's died. We tried. We couldn't keep him alive. John come out and started banging his head on the railings. And I just know something, something tragic had happened. Ronnie swore to avenge the death of his youngest brother. It wasn't as if he, he, he hurt my David. He killed my David. He stabbed him for his heart. And I wasn't going to let him get away with it. 
In 1970, Alfredo Zomparelli, the cabaret bouncer who had knifed Ronnie Knight's brother, was jailed for manslaughter. Ronnie didn't mind that David's killer would be free after only three years. It made my day when I heard he only got a smaller sentence, because I knew he'd be out soon, and I was gunning for him, and he would have got it off for me. Ronnie's version of events is that another man was out for Zomparelli's blood. Some kid come up one day, told the uh, Gerard, and just said, uh, I know someone else is looking for him, Ron. And his name was Bradshaw. And I said, uh, well, if he gets him before me, it's up to him, but uh, if you want to stop me looking for him, I'll get a phone call soon after that. He said, looks like Riley's just got shot. On the night of September the 3rd, 1974, Alfredo Zomparelli was shot dead by two men in a Soho pinball arcade. Of course I wasn't sick about it, was I? I thought, well, someone's beat me to it then. Well, I got pulled in for it, obviously. Police questioned Ronnie Knight but released him. He didn't reveal he'd met one of the killers and had given him money. Well, one of them come up and he said, he's done it, man. I said, good luck, yeah. And I'll give him a thousand pounds. I said, go and have a drink on me. It wasn't very prearranged, it wasn't nothing. It was just because cool. so I thought, oh, I had a grand on me. I said, there's a thousand bang. Go and have a drink. I'll give it to him, whatever, you know. And next thing you know, everyone's talking about, I paid him to do it. Yeah. In 1979, George Bradshaw, the man who was convicted of Zomparelli's murder, claimed that Ronnie Knight had paid him to do it. The trial of a celebrity husband was a sensation. Barbara Windsor was sworn in to give evidence. Her testimony helped the jury return a surprise verdict. Well, Barbara did save the day, yes. Without a doubt, she saved the day because when they come out and found me not guilty, if I had the chance, I'd have bought them champagne and caviar, they could have had what they like. Do you consider that you're a lucky man? Because that's very, very unusual. Well, I'm lucky, yes. As I said, murder charge, but I'm innocent, so how can I be lucky? Tomorrow is your 20th wedding anniversary. What do you want to do? I want to do anything to you. I used to have roast, roast potatoes, Yorkshire pudding and roast parsnips. We're very boring and watch television. No special party? Nah, and a kiss and cuddle, that's all. That's all he wants. <laughs> well, that's what he said, that's all he wants. But Ronnie's wife had a secret. An affair with her carry-on co-star, Sid James. Can you hear me? I, was ne I never ever said anything about Sid James myself, ever, ever. And then about 14 years ago or so, uh, his agent, wrote a book and he wrote about our affair and then as I say put it in print and then for her to mess about with Sid I couldn't believe it I shouldn't think no one else could either <laughs> it's bad I was give Sid money every uh, you know beginning of the week to Saturday and he used to pay me back you know because they he's supposed to be in a game they said at that time Knight was accused of trying to scare off Sid James by having someone drive an axe into his kitchen floor. It's completely nonsense. If I wanted to go to Sid, I'd go and Sid and tell him, give him a smack man the ear roll, wouldn't I? If I wanted to, but I, you, you know, it didn't affect me no more. But Ronnie was also keeping secrets from his wife. He claims he invested in a Soho escort agency. Obviously, Barbara, I wouldn't have told Barbara anyway, because I don't think she would agree with that, you know, because it's involved with, with girls. Ronnie kept quiet about other investments in the skin trade. A peep show. That's what they used to call a peep show. It was like a stage and and that uh, used to close and the girls used to perform on the stage and all that. So I put thirty thousand pounds in it. And then that's how it all started off and I had my regular wages every week. While Ronnie cashed in on peep shows, his brother John had more dangerous ventures. Armed robberies were very, very prevalent through the 70s and 80s. Usually cash in transit from banks, 10, maybe 12 per week. Um, serious robberies where their gangs were armed um, and stealing normally £20,000 upwards. Uh, obviously prepared to use the weapons that they had, so it made it very, very serious and uh, it was running right at that stage. Um, well, the most um, professional of them obviously worked in gangs of six. Mainly, they were professional men um, that if you met them elsewhere, at a golf club, um, any other club, you wouldn't know the difference. But when they're engaged 
on their business, they can be extremely violent. There may have been several weeks um, where they were watching premises. We are looking at uh, one of these security express motors that delivers not only silver but also um, uh, paper money as well. And the idea was to go over Security Express Wall where the vehicles were parked up loaded. Drill an hole in the side of this vehicle so we make an entrance so we could take the silver out. It would have been big enough for someone to sort of slide in and uh, unload the silver from inside to the out. Obviously I knew John was going to do something big. It was going to be the coins, the bag of coins and all that, uh, the, the, the security, which would have been a couple of million pounds, I suppose, or uh, he worked it out. Though he told his brother about the plan, John Knight says he didn't want Ronnie in on the heist. Ronnie's not the robbery type. He's, he's in another scene. He's in a club scene. He, you know, racing and he, he wasn't built for that. You could see when I was eight years of age, he put me through a window. You know, all he had to do was smash the bloody window. John reckoned the Curtain Road robbery would pay enough for him to leave his life of crime. We all said, well, if we, we carry this off and we succeed, uh, there's no need to do anything else wrong again in your life. John targeted the Security Express depot in East London, known locally as Fort Knox. He found an empty building in the alley which overlooked the depot. He broke into it and conducted surveillance for a year. We could see all the back of Security Express what was going on. Uh, we could even see on a Wednesday making up wage packets. We could see the back door, we could see them unloading cash, we could see anything we wanted to see, we, we could see with these small um, binoculars. The robbers spotted a security floor. Each morning, the lone guard crossed the car park to pick up the milk delivery. A secret briefing was held at the Fox pub in Hackney. The coin heist was to become an Easter Monday assault on the building itself. To avoid clues being left on paper, John Knight mapped out the new operation using pool balls. The plan is changed now, boys. We are going to do the Security Express robbery. I was asked, would it be more than two million pounds? I said, definitely. They're storing up because of the bank holiday Monday. And we'll have a hell of a lot of money in there. Um, it could be three million, four million. Could be more. I was told that it could hold ten million pounds. This is the building we are in. This is the three vehicles in the compound. Security Express Yard. There's Security Express building. This is the guard. And these are all the guards that are going to come in. We leave this building and go into that yard, make our way around the compound and make our way to the dustbin area, which we will wait until the guard comes out to pick his bottle of milk. Eventually, all these men, which are the guards, will enter that building Shotguns won't be loaded, they're only used as a brightener, so um, we'll go from there. All transport's got, all transport is waiting. All we've got to do, boys, is to go in there and get it. The Curtain Road depot was to be commandeered for eight hours. Eight guards held hostage and cash weighing five tons stolen. To pull it off, nothing could be allowed to go wrong made sure the alley was clear and I propped uh, one ladder against the wall and one of the firm 
give me the other ladder, I propped it over the other side, climbed over, and then just waited for them to come up. Once the next one come up, I dropped down into the yard. We made our way down to the dustbin. Well, this is the dustbin area. As we was all waiting behind here, the six of us, ready for the guard to come out, who was on for that day shift. And uh, as soon as he come out, we see him come rushing out and got a hold of him. He had to go back in that room to let the others in. Without the guard seeing him, they'd, they'd have known something was wrong. When we brought him eventually up to this, to let all the staff in, governors, two chaps was underneath, making sure, with shotguns, making sure that he'd done what he's told. At 11 a.m., the first guard was let in, overpowered and tied up. Four more were bound and gagged over the next two hours. By 1.30, the robbers had six hostages at their mercy. The trap was now set for the guards who could unlock the vault. I was a vault custodian at Security Express on the day of the robbery. In the vault on that day, there was six and three quarter million. Obviously, they was waiting for me and Jimmy Alcock to turn up. I had one set of keys, Jimmy had the other set of keys. We both had combinations, and he needed all four to actually get into the vault. I walked through the door, I see Greg Council standing in the control room. We couldn't have tape on him, because he had to look at him and smile, and let him in. Uh, he smiled at me, and just waved me through to the airlocks. As I went through the second airlock door, three masked men jumped up with saw of shotguns. They thought it was a joke. They thought, they, you know, they, until they see we meant business. They just said, don't panic, uh, you'll be all right. And they covered my eyes up with the last of pass straight away. They then took me downstairs to the canteen. They started asking me questions about the vault doors, the keys and the combinations. Obviously, I was scared at the time. And they were just going on. I was just hoping the shotgun never had a hair trigger, it would go off on me. And I was just forcing my head down all the time, um, just trying to get the uh, combinations. When the other custodian, Jimmy Alcock, arrived, the robbers took their last hostage. We were told that he had the keys and he knew where the keys were. But when Jimmy Alcock tried to hide the location of the keys, the heist took a potentially lethal turn. Security Express robbers threatened torture when their final hostage defied them. They didn't know whether I was lying or Jimmy Alcock was lying. So they was getting like really agitated. They was forcing the gun in the back of my head, pushing me down. Saying like you're mucking us about. Like we know you know you know where the other combination is. But they said there was a person upstairs who wanted to pour petrol over me if I was mucking them about or if I wasn't telling them the truth. The threaten with petrol, I can't understand, and I don't know where it come from. I did not take petrol in there, but they're all done as they're told. The combinations were produced after the threats of burning. Alan Grimes was led to the vault at gunpoint. Then they took me through to the main vault. At the main vault door, there's two combinations. And they took the, like, the plaster away from your eyes, just enough to see the combinations. I undone both the combinations and turn, that's like a big wheel on the vault door, turn the big wheel open and open the vault. When them doors opened, it was beautiful. It was like Aladdin's cave. And it's true what they said, it, it was like Fort Knox. It was full up with money. Actually full up with money. There was bags hanging over, on the trolleys. It was beautiful. They told me to sit down in the corner, uh, put a bag across the top of my head, and told me to lean forward. Then somebody shouted out, where's that crowbar? And I thought, here we go, this is going to be the end now, I'm going to get a crowbar across the back of the head. But what had happened was somebody had used it to smash open one of the uh, cages that was containing money. So we started dragging these trolleys to the loading bay. 
drag them like this to the loading bay and just slung them through. Loading up, slinging them out. Very tiring. 30 grand, 10 grand. We just non stop until someone shouted out, We're full up, stop now. When they tied me up, they tied me up downstairs in the crew room. And they tied me up using pairs of tight. I'd lay down and said, hold on a minute, Al, I'll go and get a pillow for your head. They was probably thankful that I assisted them to open it up for them. A brilliant job. A brilliant job done. The robbers made their getaway in a truck repainted to look like a cash transit van. We felt great. Uh, you could see um, the eyes light up of everyone. Um, you could only see their eyes anyway because they were still masked up. Everyone uh, done their job in the robbery and uh, they were glad to get out of that building and get on. The robbery squad got a call that the um, depot at Secure Express in Curtin Road had been robbed. The figure quoted at the time was uh, in excess of seven million, which of course made it phenomenal and uh, the biggest cash robbery in the UK ever. I walked into the yard at um, the depot at Security Express. The only thing we found untoward in the car park uh, was some scrapings on the wall where it appeared that um, some men had clambered over. When uh, we went into the um, basement and to the locker room where we hoped that would be uh, lots of evidence but uh, at the end of the day um, there was hardly anything at all except for one cigarette butt that was found on the floor. From the beginning um, nearly the whole of the flying squad was employed on this um, inquiry that was um, some 70 men and it was going to be a difficult one right from the start because there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever. No sightings, no descriptions, no vehicles. Um, they came with masks, left with masks, and, um, and that was all we had. Um, and apart from the money they took, um, there was nothing else that we could see was involved. <laughs> All the evidence from express robbery, from every robber, white right, clothing and all that, had to be burnt. It had to be burnt straight away. I personally burnt the ladders myself. The money should have gone to somewhere out of range. I was let down, so I went to my partner. And my partner agreed to have monies in his house so we can count it. Three million pounds were counted in the bedroom of John's business partner, Alan Opiola. It started off two foot, three foot, and then it went up to about four and a half foot high. And uh, in bundles, in bundles, and um, a wideness, five foot, five foot wide. Accomplices, drivers and five other robbers were paid their cut. I ended up with £400,000. It's up to me now to hide it. The first 48 hours off the robbery are most crucial because um, you have to bear in mind that um, the robbers had to get rid of the vehicles they'd used, the bags that the money contained, and of course put the money to bed somewhere hide it. I went into my greenhouse and I dug a hole right down in the soil and buried it. I put the soil back with fertilizer on top and I planted tomatoes. I wanted to find a way to get under thousand over to Spain. I could not use that type of money here. I could spend it freely over in Spain and I had ideas of buying a villa and furnishing it out and everything. I phoned Ronnie up and lucky enough he was on his own, Barbara's working. He said oh, I'll come round in you know, a couple of hours time and all that so I said okay. 
next thing I know the door goes and I open the door and it's my Johnny with this case in his hand and I shut the door and we grabbed hold of one and I said you've done it mate he said yeah it's all done there and it? but he patted me on the back uh, he, he couldn't believe it he, he was well pleased and uh, and then we sat down and he started telling me I said well this is a it wasn't this amount of money he said he said I know he said it's just one of them things it, it worked out better for us and all that you know he said, now you've got to be careful, because it's, uh, it's a big one. And I said, how much have I got to take, please? We'll take the seven thousand pounds. And I said, that do me, that won't be no trouble. Um, there was no actual evidence that the Knight family were involved in the early stages, although uh, the Knight family were put forward as perhaps being responsible, but um, their names were put forward by, with several others. So therefore, it was a matter of um, sifting through what we had uh, to try and establish who was in fact responsible. But others had their suspicions about Ronnie Knight. He'd begun an affair with another woman, Susan Haylock. And night to me, uh, Barbara must have uh, smelt something out somewhere or the other. I can't see why, because she was enjoying herself, wasn't she? But, uh, I had a feeling that something was following me, it was, a, I think it was a Jaguar. And I would never thought it was a private, oh, I'm thinking it's the other people, you know, the police. And then I pulled up, stopped one side, that stopped, and I pulled into the block of flats, and that pulled up outside the flat, and things like that. The next thing I know, about an hour went by, and there's a knock on the door. And I answer the door, and it's Barbara standing there. <laughs> She's caught me. Oh, I got a bit of verbal from her, which I suppose I'm entitled to have. And then I uh, just went downstairs, and then, you know, she, the cab went off, and I got, she got in my car, and I took her home. That was their breaking point. That made it, uh, made it quicker than what it was going to be when she caught me. Him and Barbara made arrangements to part. In the same time, he had my money moved over to Spain. For seven months, Peter Wilton had had no luck tracing the missing millions. Then came a tip about where some men who'd helped shift the money did their drinking. We kept surveillance on a public house for several months. It wasn't until we brought this man in, Mr. Horsley, that we realised that we were on the right track because um, after a few hours at the police station he actually told us things we wanted to hear. I was mentioned by Horsley. Unfortunately my name was given to Horsley to the police that I could be one of the robbers. When he told us about a sum of money which was hidden in his um, father-in-law's house um, or flat it was in Waltham Abbey and um, the following day actually we went there and found it hidden away in a, in a cupboard that one would have never found it if we hadn't been told and I think when I saw that money there I think I then realized that we had got a major breakthrough. The £240,000 was the first cash police had recovered. They now had to prove it was from the robbery. Each individual note was examined uh, and of course my officers were looking for signs or uh, writings, anything like that, so as we could identify the notes and connect them to the actual robbery at Security Express. Witness John Horsley suddenly withdrew his statement. Police feared the gang was out to silence anyone who revealed its secrets. But Horsley's information about a hired van would lead them to someone who would talk. Uh, Mr. Horsley told us about a hired vehicle um, which took us um, a great deal of trouble to trace. Eventually we did and it led us to an associate of John Knight. Alan Opiola was um, John Knight's co-partner in the garage in Southgate and so it proved a great association uh, to us in the case. You've got to trust someone, and uh, I did trust him. 
You give all my secrets away. When Alan Opiola revealed he had helped count the money, the police feared for the life of their new star witness. He was offered a new identity under the Witness Protection Program. Mr. Opiola told us eventually of the money being brought to his own house while it was counted. Of course, we could associate Mr. Opiola with the Knights quite easily. My wife had been to Henlow Grange to keep fit for the weekend, and I went down to pick her up. As I drove down the side of the golf course and entered my gates at the end of the drive, um, a vehicle pulled out behind me. I drove in my drive and there was a, a body of men waiting near the swimming pool. Well, I did remember turning round to John and saying in the car, what the bloody hell are these doing here? What have you been up to? And he just said nothing, you know. He said, uh, I'm arresting you uh, for the Security Express robbery. Anything you say may be taken down and give it in evidence against you. I said, have you a warrant? I said, yes. I said, come in. When the flying squad arrested John Knight for the six million pound Security Express heist, his brother made a run for the villa they'd built together in Spain. I told you to go and have pistols. I had Johnny's money, remember that, and I knew that, you know, once they check that out, which, you know, the police ain't silly, I've got to be pulled in. I want to be pulled in while I'm here, because I wouldn't have had no chance. My name's Ronnie Knight. I had no chance. So I thought, so I'm going to go anyway, and I'm going to go now. Ronnie left for Spain. He did not run away because of a robbery. He ran away to meet his new girlfriend, which he was going to spend the rest of his life with. Ronnie Knight had media appeal. The views from his quarter of a million pound villa in the hills above Fuengarola were some of the most spectacular on the coast. It was here that Knight sought seclusion from awkward questions about the Security Express robbery. Knight's notoriety brought unwelcome attention to the business arrangements of other expatriates who'd headed to Spain for sun and freedom. The manager of John Knight's pub, The Fox, was one of those who'd headed to Spain. Cliff Sachs had cashed in his East End life and bought two luxury villas. Mr. Sachs was actually interviewed in Spain, um, and it was then quite apparent um, from him that The Fox public house had been used um, to store um, some of the money. If I'd have known I would have told Cliff Sachs to clear that cellar out. Well, let's put it this way. This money I have in my possession now is very clean. If this money would have been left in that corner, in this cellar, in the dampness, after a day or two, this would smell very musty and damp. People would smell it just holding it like that. The smell of money became quite important. The jury at the trial were actually taken um, to the premises, in particular to establish the smell. Um, and uh, I think it was quite clear to them that um, the smell was very similar in the basement to that of the smell of the money. It showed the connection between John Knight, Cliff Sachs, the cellar, and the Fox public house. So. All in all, it was a vital piece of evidence uh, that proved vital in our case against John Knight and the others. In 1985, five men were found guilty of robbery and handling money from the Security Express heist. They were sentenced to a total of 66 years. The eldest Knight brother, Jimmy, received eight years for handling £200,000. But the judge singled out John Knight for the harshest sentence. Barbara had come round and told me that he'd got 22 years. And uh, just flipped. So that was the worst moment, yeah, definitely. It was the press who come and told me. He said, uh, looking down me over my gates and said, Ronnie, you're the badger bell. I was walking the garden. 
And I said, well, what do you mean I've heard it? He said, he just got 22 years, and it was like uh, you know, laughing at me. I said, why don't you, whatever, you know. And they were, man, I just squeezed the hose at him, you know. Peter Wilton's team celebrated the convictions with a cake in the shape of a security express van. But with millions of pounds still missing, investigations moved further afield. Robbery squad detectives have been to Spain where there are five men they'd like to question about the raid and the missing four million pounds. But Britain has no extradition treaty with Spain, so British police can only stand in the sidelines and gather evidence where they can. It must be awful being in Spain, knowing where these people are, knowing who they are, not being able to touch them. Yes, yes, I felt at times uh, I could put my hand on their collar, but uh, um, we just have to bide our time. And any idea where the missing four million is? No idea. Uh, we think we might know where some of it is, but it's a very small proportion. Would Spain feature there as well, do you think? Yes, some of it, yes, some of it in Spain. Properties, bank, bank accounts, things like that. And fling! Ronnie Knight had secretly used Barbara Windsor's accountant to shift £264,000 to Spain. Police and the press watched how he spent it. Mr. and take them away! Mr. Knight has now acquired business interests with this Indian restaurant. It's got a used to be in Spain, and seven years old, that restaurant in Spain, it? and it's still there. Because it was, uh, everyone loves Indian food. They won't let you know nothing, these boys here. Won't let you know, won't they tell you the spices they put in them? It's all secret. Ronnie made no secret of spending money on his new life with Susan Haylock. Eventually I, I finished up getting married, another big dude there, they never got it, it goes for about uh, £7,000 and all. That's with the fireworks this pay and all. And I invited everybody, all my pals went there, you know, they was all over there. Police tracking the robbery found four of their suspects were guests at Knight's wedding. They were among a community of British criminals living luxury lifestyles on the Costa del Sol. It was just unbelievable life. You could get up in the morning, just put your shorts on. You wasn't worrying about it because there was no way it was going to rain. Oh, I was very jealous. I was very, I was very jealous of that. All oh, the lights would have been out there. All oh, the lights would have been out there. I knew that I was going to be arrested, but I didn't run away. I faced the music. Johnny got nicked. And he, I mean. I didn't get nicked for it. I, I suppose if I was here, I might have got nicked for it. I was satisfied. I had my clubs and uh, I had the restaurant, so that, you know, I'm suited there. It's when I branched out to property. That's where I'd done wrong. Knight bought up luxury Spanish apartments, but he claims stolen money was eaten up by bad investments. I put it into a property, and that's when the, uh, the, the peseta went down. So the next thing I know to get rid of them, I had to go our price. I'm selling them our price, just to get rid of them. After the property crash, Ronnie's marriage to Susan Haylock began to fall apart. It's just like Billy Bob. She was kind of working all the time and leaving me on my own, and that's what she wanted to do. So I said, well, you do what you want to do. In 1994, Ronnie Knight accepted a cash deal for newspapers and television to cover his return to Britain. Were you in any way connected with this robbery never. 11 years ago? No, never. The police say you, you were. Well, they think I were. They think I was supposed to be brothers. While selling the story of his innocence, Ronnie kept secret the fact that the breakdown of his marriage had contributed to his decision to return home. Don't stop by the Oh, this is it there. The, the private plane come, you know. <laughs> Off we go and up there and there. Getting nearer and nearer, you know. And I'm, Oh, Jesus Christ, it's getting too near to me now. And uh, I don't know why what's going to happen. And uh, the only mistake I've done on that plane is, is when they give me the bottle of champagne. Now that looks like I'm being flashy and all that, but there's no way I meant it that way. He was there waiting for me. Mine was only two of them. Mr. Reed and uh, I forget the girl's name now. It's like, oh, they just sings the night, can we talk? You under arrest, anything to say, and uh, that was the beginning of my 
Wilkram party back in London. Ronnie Knight was brought to court this morning. Tonight, only a day after flying home, Ronnie Knight is locked up in a small cell in Brixton prison. After a decade of public denials, Ronnie Knight pleaded guilty to handling £384,000 from the robbery masterminded by his brother John. I think deep down as a villain and, and a thief, um, uh, to go and do security expropri- express robbery was a great thing. But deep down, looking at it all, there was plenty of money there. I trusted a lot of people. The robbery was done. I come unstuck, right, and crime did not pay me on security express robbery. Why? I was caught. I think if you get five, I've got a seven. I've done it now, so I'm free. <laughs> All right, I've been villains, but I never knocked anybody about whatever they've done. I've got money with their brains. So that's the story of my life. Well, not quite. Ronnie wrote a book saying he was behind the murder of Alfredo Zomparelli, the killer of his youngest brother. Parliament began debating changes to the double jeopardy law to allow acquitted suspects to be retried for murder. Uh, The most famous case perhaps is Ronnie Knight. Uh, A jury found him not guilty of a gangland murder when Alfredo Zomparelli was gunned down in the Golden Goose in Soho. He admits he got away with murder, in this case uh, that's exactly in literal sense, uh, although he didn't pull the trigger himself, he gave a contract killer a, quote, nice big envelope to do it. We've got to have revenge, and that was my revenge. It's my brother, it's my family, and I would have done anything for my family. And I know my Johnny would have done the same. If he'd have had the chance, he'd have done the same. But fortunately, I went out more than my Johnny did. Though he wanted to, but he, he left it to me. And uh, I'm sure if I'd have had, I knew where I was going to get him, I'd have let my Johnny know I was going to go there and do him then. No, we're nothing like the Mafia. We, it's just herself. Mafia kills anybody for anybody else for money. I don't. He was my brother. He was my, he was our greatest. He was a younger kid. He's 21. He was lovely. videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.